It's got to be better here in 19 for Florida State. Uh, Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, running down the Seminoles position by position. We don't dare forget about the special teams here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, as we break down every position on just as many teams as we can possibly get to. And of course, we're not going to miss Florida State as well. Here again, I'm Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. So hopefully you've checked out the previous segments. Uh, if you haven't, you got the offense, the defense, go wild, dig in, get yourself set for 2019, courtesy Jason Parker from Chop Chat. All right, Jason, we've got a situation with a kicker, and I find this interesting in that uh, this happens quite often. Now, I'm not going to be able to single out particular kickers, but they come into college football, they're rather successful, and then at some point, it's like a golfer in his swing. They Something gets into their head, they have a misconnect at some point, and then it continues and becomes a habit, and I don't know if that's been the case with Aguayo, but 11 for 17, 64% uh, accuracy last year compared to 73%, and in 86%, 18 for 21, 2017. So is there cause for concern? Was he kicking them from distance? Your thoughts about Aguayo? I think Aguayo, his biggest problem is his older brother, Roberto Aguayo. I will say it because of this. Roberto Aguayo is arguably the greatest college football kicker ever. You saw what he did in that 2013 season where he missed one kick the entire season. One field goal attempt was all he missed. I think, and you look at what, what Ricky did. Ricky, his first game against Ole Miss, he had six field goals setting a school record. I think that was his biggest problem is that there was just that highness and he was supposed to just come in. And I don't think it's that he is bad. At all, I don't think it's that he's not successful. I think that there's just so much, so much pressure, both with his name, with his brother's legacy, with what he did. That yeah, I think I think yips might be the best way to put it. He's he's got the golfing yips. Um, I think he will be challenged. I think Ryan Fitzgerald coming in, kicker from uh, the state of Georgia, will challenge him in camp. Do I think that that Fitzgerald will be the starting kicker? Uh, when FSU takes on Boise State, no, I don't think that. But I think that FSU, I think Aguayo has continued to kick because there really hasn't been anyone. I think they tried out Logan Tyler a couple times, the punter, uh, kicking uh, a few field goal attempts, and it just didn't turn out well. I think you you have a situation there where I think knowing, though, that Fitzgerald is there might put a little bit of pressure on Aguayo to, to, to be a little bit more successful, be a little bit more accurate. I will say one thing about the punting situation without making any evaluation on Logan Tyler based on his stats, based on what I saw last year, he needs to punt less than he did in 2018. 82 punts. It's rather high. I remember looking at some anemic Wake Forest offenses. This is like five, six years ago before they they turned it around on that side of the ball, uh, punting more than 100 times per season. So 82 is rather high. Uh, you would like to drop that figure about 10 or 15 times. Uh, because that's going to speak to the production of the offense. But uh, Logan Tyler's uh, very consistent. Logan Tyler has the leg. I mean, he's you know he's only six foot. He's one hundred ninety two pounds, but he has the leg to to be successful. Now that being said, and you you hit the nail right on the head. You know, you look at last season. You know, the, the season finale against Florida, nine punts. The Clemson game, twelve punts. The Syracuse game, ten punts. You know, I'm just looking at the stats off the top of my head. I believe there's one, two, three, four of the eight games he had five punts or less. The other eight games he had six punts or more. That to me, you know, not just saying as a biased FSU fan who expects, you know, massive offensive results, but that's un borderline unacceptable if you are going to be a Florida State offense to have your punter punting six or more times a game. So I think if he, if he can be a lot smoother, asked to do a lot less work, then I think the FSU will be fine with their punting game. Okay. I just wanted to see something. I'll make a little edit here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, 
Talking special teams with uh, Jason Parker from Chop Chat. Uh, catch him and the rest of the crew there at uh, Fan Sided on Florida State football coverage. Uh, DJ Matthews with a big uh, return to the house against uh, Miami. That was his lone touchdown in the punt return game, which, of course, those plays are very special and very rare. Uh, your thoughts about uh, the rest of the special teams units when it comes to coverage and returns and Matthews in particular? Well, this has been a knock on FSU special teams for a couple seasons now that essentially, and it started with the last administration and now it's going on with, with uh, Willie Taggart last season. It's not letting these guys return the ball. Yeah. There's going to be some times where they're going to get, you know, tackled for a couple yards lost. There's going to be some times where there may be a fumble or two. And, and does that, does that stink? Absolutely. But then you're going to have that Miami game. And I was there for that game and you saw, and you had the same, general reaction from the FSU fans, alumni, and whatnot who were around me in that area was, you know, where has this been? This, these are guys who were brought in. DJ Matthews, towards the end of 2017, you saw when he was able to return punts, when he was able to return kicks. He had some successful runs, and then you see what happened in the Miami game last year. I think you're going to start to see that more this season. I think there's going to be a little bit more of, you know what, let it fly. And yeah, you may have one or two punt returns where, you know, you get a yard or two, or you may lose a couple yards, but you're going to have that 60 yard return. You're going to have that 70 yard touchdown. That's going to make it worth it. Yeah. So my thought process here is your Florida state, you generally have better talent than just about anybody you play. The other two to four teams that you play in your schedule, you have as good a talent as they do. And maybe there might be one team that shows up on a schedule, mm, Clemson, that has better talent, even though the recruiting rankings would tell us not really. Uh, so therefore, why not take advantage of that talent advantage in the punt return game? When Because when you mention, uh, yeah, sometimes you'll, you'll see a handful of times uh, during the course of a season, probably more than that, one or two times probably in returning punts per game that the guy catches the ball the 26 and he kind of jukes and then he gets thrown for a two-yard loss. Okay, you started at the 24 instead of the 26. You can't tell me that that offsets the probability that over the course of 10 or 12 punt returns over the course of three or four games that he's not going to not break one always for 60 or 70 yards, but have an 18 yard return, a 22 yard return, a 13 yard return and give you better field position. Yes, there are instances in which we've seen coaches make a wise decision based on the inability of the players that they have on that roster, even though they're very talented, catching the ball as a wide receiver, running um, uh, otherwise, once they've secured the ball, is that they just don't have a dependable guy that can secure the ball and they have to make. Um, they have to safeguard against that. But that situation is typically rare. If you've got the better talent most of the time or like talent the rest of the time, then why not give these players the, the opportunity to make a play and help the offense? Well, I th and, and I think to an extent, I think that that last season you had, you had Coach Tiger who came in, you know, December of 2017, you know, was around the team, but was was still dealing with the whole moving in, bringing a new staff, trying to to fix a horrible recruiting class when he came in that he was able to to salvage into a top twenty recruiting class. Um, I, I don't know. I want to I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that last season that there was maybe some trust issues, and you've heard a lot of the stuff that's come out about what went on behind the scenes. I think now that you're in year two, you're with the guys that he has been able to get rid of some of the problems uh, that were in the locker room, maybe some of the problems on the coaching staff for, for, you know, a lot of that stuff hasn't come out yet. So that's going to be, that's going to be the biggest question is, you know, does he, does he let, you know, let's say DJ Matthews is returning punts in the opener against Boise state. Does he let him go out and, and, and return every single one? Does he not call a fair catch at all? Do I think that'll happen? No, but I think that you will see a lot more of a trust in both both Matthews, James Blackman, uh, you know, Stanford Samuels the third, all these guys. I think you will see a lot more trust this coming season. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think FSU will be much more successful this season, is that there will be trust between the coaches and the players at every position.
All right, Mark Rogers TV, with the help of uh, Jason Parker, they're at Chop Chat, uh, breaking down Florida State football personnel on both sides of the ball. So please check out all the videos, get yourself set for 2019, and join us each and every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern Time right here for live Florida State Talk, where you can interact with us. Jason, we appreciate you stopping by. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it.